My name's Erica Wolf. I'm a professor here at SAS. I teach courses about art, about history, about visual culture. I'm originally from New York City. I went to undergraduate at Princeton University, where I studied sociology and history of science and technology. I did my PhD at University of Michigan. Before I did my PhD, I worked in the art world in New York City at the Whitney Museum and got interested in making a career out of studying art and the visual. What we do, and on a daily basis, in classrooms, in exchanges, among the researchers, at public events of the schools, is we're exchanging ideas and we're creating ideas and we're engaged and we're thinking. And that, to me, is the value of a place like SAS. Well, you're exposed to many different ideas, different viewpoints, different cultures, different approaches, and you learn how to maybe look at challenges or questions from various viewpoints, but also to be aware that there may be some very different approach or set of ideas or concepts to apply to something that you think you know a lot about and that you're maybe the expert about, but you'll then get a whole different set of ideas. As an undergraduate, as a student here, you'll learn how to think outside the box. The way that the world is developing now between uh, digital transformations, the transformed nature of the economy, you can't just think, I'll train for this career and I'll do that the next 40 years. It doesn't work that way. You need to be flexible. You need to be comfortable in developing broader literacy or simply becoming comfortable at speaking to people from different areas. That's our ideal graduate, is going to be someone who has strong expertise in one thing and good competence in that, but who also has the confidence and the intelligence to speak with people across disciplines. Maybe they're studying art history with me, but they feel very comfortable when dealing with physics or chemistry. I think it's, it's sort of, uh, it's difficult to be a young person today and to be someone finishing up high school and thinking about what do I do next, where do I go to school, uh, what do my parents want me to do, what do I want to do, what kind of future do I have. That's, it's hard. That's a lot to be dealing with. And you're just also a young person and you've got life itself to deal with, right? I know coming to SAS, it's a very different type of school. So your parents may have one idea about what university is about and what you should be expecting, but we don't follow that model. You don't major, you don't specialize until your third year, but your parents are used to saying, oh, you should go into this, you know, Accounting's a good idea, or IT's a good idea. It's hard. As a, a general sort of rule of thumb, I think it's good to get out of your room, literally get out of your room, get out of your house, go out into the world. Try to, try to experience the world, find out what pe people do and what, what their work life is. You know? And if you haven't done it, like as an adult, and you're adults now almost, right? 17, 18. See if you can go to work one day with your parents. Seriously. See if you can come along and, or, or get an internship. See if you can go and, and spend a couple of weeks working at a local publishing house or seeing is there a task at the local literary museum that they need someone to come in and and sort out some of the collection or help organize something or set up a summer program for, for school children. Go out and, and, and try things. And I think that's important because if you don't go out and try things then you, and don't have that real world experience, you won't know whether you actually like the culture of a particular type of work, whether you'll have satisfaction in life. Now, my own, my own case, after university, I didn't go to graduate school right away. I went to New York City, and I did enroll in a sort of alternative uh, curatorial studies training program. 
uh, at uh, the Whitney Museum. And I got a scholarship to do that, which was great. So I was in that program for a year. And then after doing that program, I was hired by the Whitney Museum and was part of the curatorial staff there. And I, I worked on basically putting together exhibitions, working with the curator, doing a lot of the research and groundwork, and actually doing a lot of writing. And I really liked that work. And I, I discovered, OK, this is, this is nice work. It doesn't pay much, but I really enjoy it. But then I also realized that if I wanted to get ahead and go further in this field, that I probably wanted to, I needed a graduate degree. But I, I knew from having worked in there a couple of years that that was good. But I also realized that in the museum world, there were, there were nice things about it and less nice things. And I decided you know, maybe, maybe being more of an academic researcher was for me. I also took a couple months off before I went to graduate school. And I, wound, I worked as a, a, what's called a temporary in New York, or a temp, where you just, you're brought in to help cover office stuff. And I wound up working as a administrative assistant at Time Magazine in the advertising department. <laughs> it was very funny. I got paid a lot more than I got paid at the museum, although it was like on the next one block over from where my office had been. Uh, and I worked with the advertising executives. Many of them had actually studied art history in, in, uh, at university, and they loved me. They'd take me out to lunch all the time. They'd get me involved in stuff. And I realized, well, this isn't necessarily my path, but I know that if, if I don't like graduate school and I decide to quit the PhD, I could easily have a career in advertising. It was comfortable, the people seemed nice. It wouldn't be my, you know, it wouldn't be something I'd live for out of passion the way that I feel about my research now, but I would have a pretty nice life, you know, in New York City as, as an, either an account agent or working for an advertising firm. I didn't have to do that. It turned out I really enjoyed going into, into research and, and, I, and I'm good at it and I've had a really amazing career that's brought me to very many different places. But just going out there and, and getting experience is probably the most important thing. I've had friends who like went to law school, did all that horrible stuff you have to do to get a law degree, and then into law and realized they hated it, that they just couldn't live with themselves. And then realized, oh, this is what I really love. So again, I, I think getting experience and, and finding out what type of environment you like what makes you get up and go in the morning? What brings joy to your life? And here I'm going to refer to Bogdanov, a Russian philosopher. Alexander Bogdanov, I think. Who wrote about, uh, so, so one of these sort of, you know, utopian theorists. And he talked about the breakdown between the difference of work and play. So that if, you're, if you can find a, a profession or a job that's actually not a job, that's more like a, a passion, a game for you, and your work is more like play, then you can have a happier life. So you need to find and make your own decisions. Yes, you don't want to upset your parents, and sometimes it will take getting someone to, uh, getting a mentor, getting maybe a professor, or someone you've, uh, an, another adult who is, you know, already established to come and have a chat with your parents. I did that when I applied to graduate school in art history. My mother was a little worried. Uh, my sister was a, a classical musician, and she was very irresponsible with money and, and always causing problems. I needed to calm my mother that I could have a normal career and, and be a good professional. So I had a former professor of mine who at that time was curator at the National Gallery of Art have lunch with my mother. She came, they, they met in New York City and had lunch, and that really reassured my mother that uh, there were older people who were sort of like her, who were well-established, had comfortable lives, and could talk about what being a professional art historian was. I've been traveling and working in Russia for 25 years, but largely in Moscow, Petersburg, and then I've done some regional travel related to research. So I've been to Magnitogorsk, Belomor Canal twice, Solovetsky Ostrov. I first came to Siberia because of SAS. I spent part of my childhood in uh, the Midwest, in Minnesota, which is the climate's very similar to um, to men's. When I came here to start working, I started to realize that the Siberians are actually very much like the people I grew up in, in Minnesota. And some of you may have seen the, the TV show Fargo. Okay, that's shot in Minnesota, right? 
And you think often they're outside in the snow and they're sort of friendly and the cup of coffee and, and, in, and I realized, well, you know, maybe it's the climate, but there's something like the Siberians are very warm and friendly. They're not abrasive like some of the Muscovites. But again, I'm, I'm a New Yorker and people think New Yorkers are rude, but part of it's they're just very busy. They're in the rat race, you know, it's like you have to hustle around the big, the big city. I find Siberia very friendly and part of it's the climate. You have to know your neighbors, you need to be ready to help each other out. Yeah, somewhat, no, and I, uh, you know, in New Zealand we don't really have winter, but we also don't really have summer. Like where I live in New Zealand, it's near Antarctica and we have penguins, right? Uh, and uh, I miss like real snow, I miss cross-country skiing, I miss beautiful sunny winter days like today. Yeah, so it's actually, it's very similar to me. I've even had experiences here very similar to my childhood. So this past weekend, uh, a group of professors and I were invited to a country house where we jumped into a hole chopped in the ice. And I think I was one of the few people there. There was another guy who spent time in Finland who had, this, this was not something new. I'm a rugby player. I played for the United States team. I played in Moscow already in 93. And, I, uh, and there is rugby here I'm, I'm getting involved with, but. <laughs> I've actually taught in Russia before. I taught at one of the uh, art academies in Petersburg and I've taught in, uh, elsewhere in Eastern Europe. And uh, often in, in Russia, there's this idea, you don't bother the professor. You do not bother the professor, right? Our school, that's one of the things that's very different. We're actually a small school. We're here to engage with you, to spend time with you, to get to know you, and to have interactions with you. We don't just have big lectures. There's actually very few lectures. We do seminars. We do small class teaching. And that's sort of scary if you're used to the idea of, oh, I don't want to talk to the professor, I don't want to be seen by the professor. And it takes a little while, but we build up trust and we help you actually build up your confidence to express yourself. And I think that's something really special here. As most Russian universities, it's like big important professors, you dare not bother them or interact, you don't want to be noticed by them, you just sort of do your work and and we're not that type of school. So if you want to be anonymous and have no interaction with anyone and not really engage much, go to one of those schools. <laughs> but if you want to be really treated like an individual and have people who care about you and want to help you develop your full potential, come to SAS. <laughs>